All right, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. We're live from StrataConf in Santa Clara, California. Uh, this is our second year of doing Strata. I'm here with Alex Williams. Uh, Alex is uh, the editor-in-chief of Services Angle, our services publication. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for, for coming on with us. And we're here with J.P. Morgenthal, who is uh, a cloud ranger. Uh, Cloud Ranger, uh, and, and you're also an in-focus blogger, right? That's correct. Yeah, yes. so uh, so welcome, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much. What the hell is a Cloud Ranger? Well, is that like a, like a Navy SEAL type it, of dude? It, it, I think that's how the name came about. Uh, it's a, a team of, uh, within the EMC Consulting that basically helps uh, executives to understand the end-to-end -end solution around uh, cloud and virtualization. Okay, so so you sit inside the services organization, and you, that's correct. You're part of the consulting group, or part of EMC Consulting, yes. Okay, so uh, so what's happening out there? What's uh, you guys are always talking about cloud and big data and intersecting? Is that? I mean, I know it's good marketing, but is that actually happening in the field? How are you making that happen? Well, it, you know, it's really interesting. I also was on uh, David Linthicum's podcast over the weekend. We had a great conversation regarding this. Uh, the question is, does big data exist without cloud computing? And uh, of course, in some regards, yes, and in some regards, no. I mean, we have been focused on business intelligence for years, and there's been a significant investment in trying to uh, manage very large quantities of data and operate on it and find solutions around you know, extracting critical pieces of information. But no matter how hard we try this, we've been hitting ceilings very quickly due to the technology. And um, in addition to that, it's, it's very, been very costly. I, I, one of the advantages that the cloud has brought is the ability to make complex data processing and uh, operating on very large volumes of data fairly inexpensive. And I think that that's brought to the game uh, a change and the ability for customers to and end users to now focus on solutions that they didn't have before. You know, the line is big data gives cloud something to do. Um, Maybe so. You think that's fair? I mean, is, uh, is, is, is yeah, people I'm, struggling to find use cases for the cloud? I mean, beyond sort of just bit buckets? Or? You know, it's interesting. I, I work with a large part of my group is very strong in information, infrastructure and operations. I happen to be the app guy. My background is more applications than it is infrastructure and operations. And so from the application perspective, I, you know, believe that the the cloud needs to be designed to handle the application specifics and that there isn't a one-size-fits-all cloud. No. You really need to design in context. And so the application is very important to the design overall architecture of the cloud. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so I'm curious about this metaphor for the, you know, that you use with the ranger. So where are the danger zones? You know, what are the, who are the heroes out there that you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis? What are, you know, what, what is the story that you're hearing from customers? Well, I mean, the, the CIO is struggling, and I hate to take a, an opportunity to plug my book here, but it, it, it's plug relevant. Plug the book, run the cube. All right, book. so uh, April 17th, uh, book's coming out, Cloud Computing Assessing the Risks, was co-authored with uh, Bernard Golden and Jared Karstensen. Um, Multi-million dollar advance for that, or? Uh, no, unfortunately. <laughs> keep working, but, uh, keep your day job. That's yeah, it. keep it in the day job. <laughs> but the, the one of the chapters I wrote was on organizational governance, and, um, and organizational change. And the cloud is really, you talk about who are the heroes, and it's the, it's the individuals in the IT shop that are struggling right now in the midst of a paradigm shift. How do I enable and, and leverage this technology without complete disruption to my organization while simultaneously battling this concept of shadow IT that's been enabled by uh, public cloud computing? So, and, the, so, the, so the villains are, are, in the pub, are the ones who are promoting the public cloud? There, there aren't heroes and villains. What there are are people trying to get work done. And um, unfortunately, people underestimate how much and how difficult it is for IT shops to manage very large organizations and constantly dealing with these disruptions. I mean, mobile computing, big data, these are now you know becoming widespread terms that people are bringing to the table. And 70 to 80% of the budget is still uh, dedicated to keeping the lights on. How do I introduce innovation? So, so how is that? A, so, so how is IT adapting in your book? Because these disruptions are just going to continue. Sure, and they're not. I mean, the book is to help them understand how to adapt. Um, hopefully, they will recognize. I mean, I'm a big supporter of this concept of uh, DevOps okay. uh, movement to that organization that's agile, working together, application. Uh, you know, development with QA, with operations, everybody understanding, no more throwing the 
uh, software over the wall and expecting operations to be able to manage this. Uh, I actually just, uh, my first blog on InFocus actually was called, uh, uh, you know, The Cost of Being Unique. And it discussed, you know, that old bravado that we used to see in IT about, hey, I'm different than everybody else. My, you know, your, your application doesn't work for me because I got my own idiosyncrasies. And, um, and so I discussed that with, you know, cloud, hopefully people are seeing that the cost of being unique could be the business in the end run. But overall, I happen to see more IT executives starting to look across the tiers and asking what are their peers doing and wanting to copy the successes and not wanting to stand out alone and say, I'm unique, um, Mr. SAP, Mr. Oracle, come in and build me a very special customized version for $40 million because I'm the, I have three things that are different. And so I think that this whole pattern is starting to emerge around managing the environment, um, relying on best practices, relying on what the rest of the industry is doing, and it looks positive. JP, the organizational discussion is, is interesting, and particularly when you, you sort of think about the IT organizations that uh, they're handicapped in a, in a big way. They've, the deck is stacked against them. You got these cloud service providers. It's almost like you got one football team who's in a dome and they're on a nice dry field and they're just throwing it down and they're having a play. And the other one's outside, it's raining, it's snowing, and you know, IT's got all this infrastructure and legacy processes built up that they've got to deal with and, and so and the CEOs saying well why can't my IT be like you know Facebook or Google it's so easy and simple and it's a single app you know and it's it's serving you know hundreds of millions of people um, so are IT organizations at a disadvantage are they beginning to sort of have to benchmark themselves against these cloud service providers who largely have a green field and how are you seeing them move from point A to point B? It is definitely an education for executives. Uh, I think the IT executive is now needs to understand what's out there for them to use, but they also need to be able to explain finally to their to the executives and to the board for you know larger companies that have that where capital expenditure comes out of the larger group exactly why in certain cases this doesn't work for their business. And there's a lot of reasons. And we you know some people are just come out as detractors against the cloud. Oh, risks are this. One of the things, there was a, a Focus.com roundtable we did last week with Randy Bias, and it was very interesting because he, one of the things that was emerged was this, one of the things that we identified with cloud that changes the game is a change from uh, risk avoidance right. to risk mitigation. So this, instead of I'm going to only, I'm going to shut out the whole war world, deny all, and only grant a few, it's I'm going to accept that bad things can occur, and I'm going to look at how I can mitigate to the best of my ability within my organization. That's a huge cost savings opportunity for an organization. Are you seeing more customers then wanting to adopt an Amazon Web Services type model where you will you know, essentially can you know, optimize your infrastructure so you have additional resources and use those resources for providing services of their own. I was talking about this with one of your one of your colleagues. I I don't see that many executives really even fully understand what Amazon offers. Uh, and Amazon is a double-edged sword. Sure, Amazon offers on-demand infrastructure. Uh, but they also offer an entire environment that is somewhat proprietary. And if you build to their environment, there's nothing else out there for you to move to with regard uh, in the service provider world. Uh, so that's a big decision. I don't, e but I really don't even see them fully understanding what Amazon is offering with that regard. I mean, the big issue that everyone is looking to is can I do the hybrid architecture and look at Amazon as a way to scale on you know out when I need to. And there's a lot of people who don't believe that that's even possible in today's market yet. We're still stuck in a very, you private or you're public, and hybrid in cases, but it's very, very strictly defined and static. It's We're, not on demand. But we are starting to see it. Eucalyptus is really <laughs> promoting this model where you can use both Amazon Web Services and and the Eucalyptus private cloud to you know to be able to spill over data, and we're seeing Gluster, for instance, and the you know the, st the storage capabilities to go over into Amazon Web Services and such. So we are starting to see that, but is that just us on the leading edge seeing that kind of thing? Yeah, I think we are on the leading edge right now. One of the things I said about Randy is that Randy's perspective, Randy Bias, who's CTO of Cloud Scaling, in case people don't aware. He, um, he's seeing something very uniquely because he's on the outer edge. He's building extremely, very, you know, very large scale infrastructures for cloud service providers. He's doing something 
that most enterprises and most small and mid-sized businesses are not doing. And so he gets a perspective on the industry that a lot of people may never see or won't see for many years to come. I think we're also in that same game. We're in the tornado. We're helping to drive it with thought leaders in the space. But there are, I mean, look at this conference. It's a great example. There are are a lot of people here trying to look at what's my next career move going to be? Am I going to be a data scientist? But if you look at what the availability of people who can actually architect large-scale data in these big data environments, it's very, very small amount of people that can do that today. Right. So um, you mentioned tornado. Uh, you are right in the middle of the tornado in a, lot of job, in a lot of ways your job is to help people get through the tornado. Exactly. But the entire vendor, the enterprise vendor community is talking cloud. Even Oracle now is talking cloud. Um, if the whole world goes to cloud, isn't that a bad thing for you guys? And if not, why not? Uh, well, it depends how you define cloud. Actually, th this was actually part of the roundtable discussion and what Brand Randy brought to the table, which is what initiated this. It started as a Twitter conversation where he um, mentioned that he didn't like what the NIST definition because he felt it was aged and it didn't really represent, it was very technical. Um, and what it brought us to is this concept of an architectural pattern as a way to describe cloud computing. And the pattern it entails all the different aspects of how you're deploying a cloud and what goes into a cloud and, and from a business perspective as well as a technical perspective. And that's changing a lot of things for us. Now, with regard to EMC, um, they, you know, we, we are very, we have a one of the things that brought me to be EMC, I'm only here three weeks, this is actually week three for me. Newbie. But, yeah, yeah, real newbie, but yeah. I love the uh, breadth of the portfolio. I think the portfolio offers uh, customers significant options to play the game, however it turns out. And so I, I don't have the concern that the cloud's a bad thing in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so you would, you would embrace that. If that's what the customer wants to do, you'll help them get there. That, um, that's our job. We're objective. I mean, we, we look to help the customer in any way, shape, or form based upon what they have um, today and what they're looking to accomplish. Excellent. Um, you mentioned DevOps before. We're launching, Alex is actually heading up this project with, uh, with his colleague, Clint Finley. We're launching DevOps Angle. Okay, um, great. We've got a meet up on, uh, on, on, on Wikibon uh, next on week, sixth. actually. On maybe the 6th. On the 6th, uh, with Munder Capital, somebody who's achieving hyper productivity with, with DevOps. Are you hearing CIOs talk more about DevOps now, or are they sort of still in the, what is that? Moment? Or is it the developers who are talking about DevOps? Or is it the operations guys? It's, it's the operations guys right now. Um, the interesting thing is I brought this uh, to a conversation on LinkedIn, and I said, do we need kind of a, a manifesto for DevOps? And I spoke to the ops codes guys, and what's happening interestingly there is that executives, and this is a fear that was brought up by the leading DevOps guys, the executives are being introduced to it in a very poor way. They're being kind of, you know, they're getting this perception that they can uh, substitute one for four with a DevOps, where I'm going to have my programmer and he's my sysadmin and he's my dev. Instead of them all together. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so he's looking at it as a way to cut headcount instead of a way to become more efficient. And so when, that, when they get that thought process, it destroys what DevOps can bring to the organization instead of being a benefit. Do you, do you see that as well? I mean, you're obviously very... Yeah, I mean, it's such a... I mean, a tornado's a good phrase for it, I think, because everything is kind of swirling up. And, and it's really, I think, in many ways, from what we see, there's a major push in ap application development. And that application development is creating much shorter development cycles. And with those shorter development cycles, you have these issues with operation. But that is the allure of DevOps, right? Is I'm going to be able to cut, the, I'm going to be able to manage but it's way a more but stuff it's a with way fewer people, But it's a cultural right? it, matter. And, but your point is, if, if you set out with that as the objective, you're going, to, so, you're going to mess it out, as opposed to maybe engineering your organization around, it's around high you know, productivity and, high, yeah, and highly motivated it, it's, people. It's an approach that, so my, my concern was, and I've stated this publicly, is that I don't think that anybody who's an enterprise programmer wants to be a sysadmin, and most yeah. sysadmins don't want to be enterprise programmers. Right. And so the, per, the, the cultural personality type that do each of these don't fit and meld into one person. No. So is it DevOps? Or is it ops dev? In other words, who's driving this? Is it the operations people or is it the application development people? Because I'm not sure I'd want my infrastructure 
work like my application development. My So my personal experience with this was I actually was in an organization where application development wrote code, threw it over the wall, over the wall into operations, and uh, every day the operations call in the morning grew by three people. And yet there was never an application developer on that call unless there was a customer in need. I think that to me the whole DevOps is that they're, that during the entire development process, operations is part of understanding the code. They're understanding what they're deploying and they're part of the architectural environment as to what this application is going to be deployed on. So that when you get to the end game, everything's been taken into account. I didn't write some middleware structure on my personal laptop running you know, VMware and now I'm going to deploy into this fixed environment where I have a bunch of stuff running on bare metal and, and things aren't performant. So it, it's getting that together and cleaning up that picture. And, and, it, and, and just from what we've written about and the people we've talked to, there are, there are ways that DevOps becomes adopted just through the use of the technology that is being used inside the enterprise such as Hadoop which does require kind of a bit of everything. You need to know operations, you need to know programming, you need to know analytics. And so it becomes kind of a, you know, um, a technology that really requires lots of skill sets. Well, JP, I didn't know what to expect from this interview. The new guy coming on, and we hadn't met before, so this has been great. We talked about cloud, did. we talked about DevOps. My last question is, let's, let's bring it back to data. How is big data changing your world? Uh, so the, the big change is really, again, looking at the ability to look at complex data and very large uh, volumes of data and, uh, and looking for an infrastructure to make that work and, and bringing the two together. So you have data scientists and the architecture. Think about architecting uh, map reduce you know, modules. What goes into that design from that application perspective? And then how am I going to deploy this and actually run this in an efficient manner? And I think that that is really the, you know, the picture that's starting to emerge here in the, in the environment. JP Morgenthal, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Uh, great Thank job, you. great interview. Really enjoyed having you. Love the energy. Uh, Cloud Ranger. Uh, good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I appreciate it. And, uh, Thank you.